my mind and out loud. I told Paul I loved him. I told him, I don't know, I just, I, I loved him and, and I promised him that I'd find out who did this to him. It's just, it's, it, 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 it's don't know what to do, but it was just, it was tough. And you promised him you would find out who did this to him? Yes, sir, I did. Have you found out? I have not. John Marvin, the brother of accused killer Alec Murdoch, takes the stand and provides emotional and graphic testimony of cleaning the crime scene as well as potential missteps by law enforcement. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Let's talk about the testimony of the last defense witness in the Alec Murdoch murder trial. As we come to the end of the trial of the once prominent attorney who has fallen from grace and is now accused of murdering his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul, by allegedly shooting them to death back on June 7th, 2021, we want to focus on how the defense wrapped up their case, and specifically the testimony of John Marvin Murdoch. This is Alec Murdoch's brother. He provided very emotional and graphic testimony. And I have to imagine that there was a strategic reason to save him for last, presumably as the last defense witness. His testimony is going to be fresh in the jury's minds as they begin their deliberations in the next few days. So let's get into it. And where John Marvin really started is he talked about the family. He talked about the relationship between Alec and Maggie, that it was a good relationship. It was a good marriage. This is consistent with what we've heard during the course of the trial, that there was not this kind of contentious relationship where Alec would want to kill his family. There was evidence that maybe there were certain problems. Maybe they were worrying about uh, the financial lawsuit that Alec Murdoch and the family was facing. There might have been concern over finances. There was even testimony that Maggie may have had her ring off at one point, but really nothing that stands out. And John Marvin explained how much he loved Paul, how he had a close relationship with him. He talked about how he actually saw Paul earlier that day. Nothing out of the ordinary. He even says he spoke to Alec on the phone when Alec was presumably driving to their mother's house. This is after when prosecutors say Maggie and Paul were killed, and John Marvin said Alec's demeanor was normal on the phone. But listen to John Marvin describe how he found out about the deaths of his sister-in-law and nephew. Alec called me and, and just absolutely hysterical. Um, as soon as I heard his voice, I knew something bad was going on. Didn't know what. Um, and, you know, and I, I'm in my pajamas. Um, he said, you know, something, something bad is really happening. He didn't, I don't know how with his exact words, but um, I think he said, uh, Maggie and Paul have been hurt really badly. Please get here as fast as you can. So it's going to be a question of whether Alec Murdoch was actually hysterically crying and John Marvin's telling the truth. If the jury accepts that, then that's going to help the defense because it shows that Alec Murdoch was genuinely distraught over his wife and son. Then again, someone could kill their family and still be upset. Interestingly, he said that when he arrived at the Moselle property, he did think that Alec had showered. Remember, Alec Murdoch said he showered before dinner that night, before Maggie and Paul were killed. Prosecution seems to suggest that Alec may have showered after the killings to clean himself up. But what we really need to discuss is what John Marvid did. So he calls a friend in law enforcement the next day, and he asks what's going on with the crime scene. And eventually he gets the green light to go in to that crime scene and listen to what happened next. And, and was it cleaned up? Um, no, Jim, it was not cleaned up. Were there skull fragments? Yeah, so... You know, so... so Excuse me, oh, this could be really difficult. So I, I could easily see where Maggie had been. You know, I saw the night before where the sheets were, but and somebody had told me that who was who, and so I could see where Maggie had been, and it was grass, and you know, they had covered it up with dirt, so there really was nothing to see where Maggie was. Um, I walked over to the feed room, and. Y'all have heard the descriptions. Y'all saw it. I've never seen pictures, and I've told them before coming to this court that I was not going to see pictures. But y'all can imagine what I experienced. It had not been cleaned up. I saw blood. I saw brains. I saw pieces of skull 
or, and, and when I say brains, it, it could just be tissue. I, I don't know what I was seeing. It was just, it was terrible. Um, and for some reason, I thought it was my, something that, that I needed to do for Paul to clean it up. I felt like it was the right thing to do. I felt like I owed him, and I started cleaning. And I can promise you, no mother or father or aunt or uncle should ever have to see and do what I did that day. I don't know. I, I, I'm not blaming anybody, but it's just, it, I was just overwhelmed. I, I did everything I could, and I, I would have moments where I would, I would, I would stop crying for a moment, um, and just, I, I, just you know, just in disbelief. Um, at one point, I called my brother Randy, and, and, and told him what I was doing, trying to describe what I was doing, and. He immediately told me to stop doing it. It, it. it was not good for me. It was not healthy for me to be there. And I, I couldn't stop. I just, I had to do it for Paul. That's just what I had to do. That is horrifying. And there are clearly outstanding questions about law enforcement allowing him to be there, not preserving evidence, mistakes they made in this investigation. And that's been a, a major point from the defense. You can't believe the state's case, the state's evidence, because there was contamination. Maybe there was evidence of other assailants that was destroyed. The, the defense has really highlighted sloppy police work. But I think the bigger issue for the jury is with this testimony, I think, is when you hear about the brutality of this attack and the defense called their own experts to suggest that Paul was killed at close range. His head was essentially, I'm sorry to say this, blown off. It may cause the jury to pause, pause to think about whether or not Alec Murdoch could really have done this to his own son. And these details are important for them to hear. It is a question I'm sure that the jury is going to wrestle with. But let's stick with the idea of John Marvin helping law enforcement. But it was brought to my attention that Maggie's phone was not there and that law enforcement had not found it. And, and I, I can't say that, in fact, it, it, I can probably say that I didn't think of it because I'm not a phone, big phone user or big app user or whatnot. But somebody brought to my attention and says, listen, if Buster or Alec, if they have an app on their phone, like find my, find my phone or find my friends or an app like that, they said you very likely can find out where the phone is if the battery's not dead. And so I, I went to Buster and... Um, Sure enough, he, I said, Buster, do you have this one of these apps like they're talking about? And he said, yeah, sure I do. I said, well, open it up. He opened it up, and he handed me the phone, and I see Maggie's name, and I press it, where, you know, to activate it, and it pings Maggie's phone just out front of the property. And I was like, I, I, I hate to say it, but I said, holy shit, there it is. And I said, Buster, I'm taking your phone. I'm going to go back down to the to the shed and show it to law enforcement and and did you who did you approach first about about the phone well i don't know who it was uh presumably it was sled agents because keep in mind i i didn't know any of these guys with sled i mean i, I there were a couple of faces that i'd seen before but i i don't know these guys um i've come to know them but i don't know them or didn't know them then so i went up to the to a sled agent and or two sled agents, and said, presumably sled agents, and said, hey, I've got Buster's phone here, and it, it's got an app on it that can find the phone, and it's showing Maggie's phone's right out here. Let's, um, y'all want to let's go get it. And he said, no need. We have technology coming later today that we should be able to find it. And it just, it blew me away that I'm sitting here showing them where Maggie's phone is, but they won't take the time to walk with me or take this phone itself. I mean, I'd give them the phone to go find it. So I walk over. I knew Duffy Stone. He was a solicitor. I knew uh, one of his investigators. I walked over to them, said the exact same thing, and they immediately said, absolutely, let's, let's go find this thing before the battery goes dead. And, and what happened? That we did that. Um, and well, we started, actually, we started walking down the, 
the, the back entrance or the kennel entrance, if you will. And as we were, and at that time, the, the agent was holding the phone. You know, I'm looking at it with him. And the, when it pings, it creates a dot or, or, a, or a location. And that dot jumped from right at the end of that road down the road, I don't know, maybe a half a mile, three quarters of a mile. Um, and so we walked back, got into a car, and drove down to where it was, it was showing the phone. And was the phone? And I rode. I rode with those agents, the the solicitor's office agents. Was the phone ultimately located on the side of the oh, road? Absolutely. We found it in a matter of minutes. Okay. Do you, do you remember how it was collected? I mean, were you present when it was collected? I was. Um, so I was on. The, there was a cow pasture on one side, and it's wooded on the other side. And I was on the side that, that the cow pasture is on, if you will. And I heard him say, "I got it." And so, you know, of course, I walked back beside his car, and, I, you know, I'm good ways from it, but I see him over there. And I think he, he took either some ribbon or some, some flagging or flagging tape and, and marked the phone. And I don't think he touched it. I think he, he left it right where it was, called SLED. And maybe at that time, maybe they had been communicating, but SLED had, had blocked off the road at this point, and one of the agents came up and picked the phone up. This again goes to the idea of law enforcement not doing the right thing, right? They're blowing John Marvin off. How was it that he was the one who found such a crucial piece of evidence, Maggie's phone on the side of the road? And then, of course, this helps suggest that Alec was cooperative with police. And if he really is the murderer, would he have been so cooperative? Then again, on cross-examination, John Marvin did admit that his brother may not have been that forthcoming. Before August of 2022, at that interview, when you heard your brother's voice at the kennels, uh, had he ever told you that he was down there just prior to the murders? No, sir. Right. Did he ever tell you that afterwards, after you listened to that video? Uh, no, sir. And I, I'm trying to think if we've, if we've been able to have an opportunity to even speak. Okay. Okay. All right. So you'd agree that if he had not told SLED that, that was not full cooperation, correct? If he had not told Sled that he was at the kennels just before the murders, he had not actually been fully cooperative. What, what's your question? Would you agree that that is not full cooperation? By him not telling Sled that he was at the kennel? Correct. I would say that, that yes, he lied. Okay. Yeah, Alec Murdoch lying about being down at the kennels, essentially the crime scene, that's not great. There's one thing to not tell law enforcement the truth, but to not even tell your own family. I mean, the jury is going to have to weigh whether he lied about this because he was paranoid from drugs and thought everyone was out to get him or because he murdered his family and tried to cover it up. John Marvin also testified that he thought what law enforcement did next in the case was quite odd. John Marvin, were, were you aware of a <clears throat> news release that was issued that morning? Tuesday, June 8th, that the public had no need to be alarmed or concerned for their safety? Yes, sir. Well, what was your reaction to that? I mean, it's, it's, it's quite baffling. It still is. Um, two people have been killed, and they're telling me that everybody's safe. I, that, that tells me that whoever's done this is in jail, and they, they are 100% positive. Because if they're not in jail... Nobody's safe. The idea here that law enforcement had tunnel vision. They only looked at Alec Murdoch. They didn't thoroughly look into other individuals like they should have. Now, I also want to hit upon another important moment from his testimony, and that is when he talked about Alec's drug problems. So if you recall, Alec Murdoch blamed his addiction for his paranoia, the reason he says he lied to police during the murder investigation, particularly, like I said, him not being down at the kennels, the crime scene before the killings. So understanding this drug addiction, understanding what he was going through is very important. Listen to what John Marvin observed. Prior to Labor Day weekend 2021, were, were you aware as to whether or not Alec had an opioid addiction? No, sir. Did uh, you transport Alec, drive in Alec, from the hospital in Savannah to a detox facility in Atlanta on that that weekend, or well, I believe it would have been on that Monday. 
Um, I was not driving. Uh, Randy and I took him. Randy was driving, and I was in the back. But yes, sir, we did take him to a detox facility. And and where was the facility located? Uh, it, just outside of Atlanta. Okay. And what was? Can you describe for the jury Alex Alex condition, like physical condition in the car? Yes, sir. So. When I met Randy over in Savannah, he had Alec, and, and I got in the car or, or Randy's truck with him. Um, I'd never seen anything like it. I've, I've seen television shows of, of talking about the leg twitching and, and the squirminess, if you will, and, and that's the first thing. I, I mean, you could just tell he was sweating. He was, he was thashing about, um, you know, Jim, it, did he turn I don't around? know how much detail you want me to go into. What, did he turn around the seat of the car? And what was he doing? Yeah, so so maybe halfway there, um, at one point, he had taken his seat belt off, and he had his head down where your fanny would be in the seat and is trying to stretch his legs and just kind of steady, just like thrashing them and kicking them. Um, it, it's just, again, I, I've seen TV, but I've never seen something like this in real life. And... Was he able to control himself? Uh, no, sir. Um, I said about detail. So he he messed himself. He he had diarrhea. Um, he just couldn't control it. And then. Um, and, and I say diarrhea. I'm not talking about at a restroom. I'm talking about in the car in his pants. Clearly, this was a serious problem for Alec Murdoch. But how the jury is going to weigh the drug factor into their deliberations, we'll wait and see. And that's all we have for you here on Sidebar, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.